Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Jim Dowling, who is the CEO of Logical Clocks and also as an associate professor at KTH. And he will be talking to us about the feature store where data engineering meets data science. So over to you, Jim. Hi. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes. What am I wearing? <laughs> this is my Very Berlin third t-shirt. So I'm not there in person, but I'm there in spirit. I'm in Stockholm, actually. So I'm calling in from Stockholm. So um, yeah, my name is Jim Dowling. I'm, uh, I have a dual position. Uh, I'm a CEO of a, a startup called Logical Clocks. And then I'm also associate professor. And this project, I'm going to talk about feature stores in general and uh, what is a feature store. But I'm also going to be specific. We have an open source feature store that we've developed. It's the first own. It's actually the only fully open source feature store in the world right now. It's called Hopsworks, and uh, we've been developing it for a number of years. Or the platform called Hopsworks for a number of years. We worked uh, on it at the university, KDH, at the Research Institute in Stockholm, Rice, and now the company are primarily driving this platform, uh, Logical Clocks. So uh, it's been a result of a number of years of work, but um, I'm going to concentrate on the feature store aspect of the platform because that it's a modular platform and we're finding a lot of interest in the platform. So the company comes from a research background and uh, our chief scientist is a professor at KTH, but we have a diverse bunch of people from different companies like Spotify, uh, Team Taylor and uh, others. So let's get started and talk about what is a feature store. Uh, this is a data engineering conference. I'm going to give a data engineering uh, perspective on a feature store because like anything, there's multiple perspectives on the same thing. A data scientist might think a feature store is an easy way for them to get features for training models, which is kind of true. But the data scientist uh, doesn't have to do all the hard work. That's the data engineer's job. You, as a data engineer, need to get the data that's over here. I'm going to use a pen. Hope that works. And we want to get it into a numerical representation that data scientists work with. So shock horror, data scientists tend to work with arrays of numbers. They don't. They work with numerical data primarily. So they don't work with varchars. Uh, they don't really care too much about about um, you know database backends, data lakes, and they don't know too much, and they don't necessarily want to know too much. So part of the challenge in in uh, building end-to-end -end machine learning pipelines is that, and you probably have heard this, if you're interested in this talk, you probably assume that a machine learning pipeline is an end-to-end -end pipeline where we take our raw data, that's R, and then we're going to transform it. We're going to transform it, and we're going to have some features, and then the features will be used to train a model with this big M at the end, our model. And it's an end-to-end -end pipeline. And uh, there are some frameworks that still believe this, um, but we don't. So what we see is that we have uh, this API in the middle, this API here, this mind the gap. Uh, this is the feature store. So I'm going to use FS to, to indicate it. And this is the API between data engineering and data science. So the data engineers over here will work with data lakes, databases, online databases, data warehouses, uh, event streams, Kafka. And what they're going to do is they're going to take the raw data and they're going to transform it into features. And we're going to call those feature pipelines. So feature pipeline is a it's effectively a data data processing pipeline that you may be familiar with from platforms like Flink and, and Spark. And the, the feature pipelines will take the raw data at the back end and transform it into features. And I'll explain what a feature is in a, in a minute because not all data engineers know exactly what a feature is. Um, so that's going to be one pipeline. And the monolithic end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline going from the raw data to the model, we're breaking up into a feature pipeline, and then we'll have a training pipeline over here. I'm going to talk about both of them, but um, we'll briefly introduce both. But basically, you'll have two pipelines, one running at one cadence, so the data will come in at a certain cadence. And then the training pipelines tend to be either uh, operationalized, and they'll run at a particular cadence as well, or a lot of them will be done on demand. So data scientists will run pipelines to create training data, uh, train models, and so on. So let's get cracking. Um, what is a feature? So here's an example of a feature, and it, it comes from a data engineering perspective. We have a table on the left-hand side. We're going to call it hotel bookings. And every time a booking is made, we enter a row in this table. And the table will have 
for example, the room number, maybe customer ID for who, who booked it, uh, the room booking dates, and so on. So I'm only showing two of the columns for simplicity. And it might, you know, you, you might have a, a row per date even, depending on how you've implemented this. <clears throat> so you might have a start date and an end date for your booking. So the features, uh, what a feature is, is think of it as being a column in a, in a table in the database that will help you predict something. So it's a, it's a piece of information that's useful for, for, for making a prediction because ultimately that's what our models are that we get in, in, in data science. We have a model and it's used to basically put in some data and make predictions. So if we can take the raw data on the left and convert it into a representation, transform it into a representation that makes it easier for machine learning uh, algorithms to work with that data, uh, to make predictions from that data, then we, uh, we do feature transformation. So an example here would be to compute this thing called the load factor. And in this case, the load factor um, is a, a load factor for a given room. And this is a feature, and that feature isn't present in the original hotel bookings database. We actually had to write some code to transform the raw data into the load factor. And load factor is quite a useful feature because it can be used for anything to predict uh, whether a room will be free. It could be, so we might have one pipeline that's trying to uh, train a model to compute whether a room will be available at a given date. But we can have another pipeline or another problem where we're trying to, to predict the amount of revenue that, that a, a, a hotel room will generate over a period of time. So there's many different uses for this feature. And that's another motivation for the feature store. So the idea behind a feature store is that if we can reuse a feature many times in many different models, well, maybe we should reuse it. Maybe we shouldn't rewrite many different pipelines to compute, recompute that feature in, in potentially many different ways which are not consistent. So you're now at the point of saying, well, maybe I could have a library for that. We're gonna see that, yes, a library will get you part of the way, but typically we actually cache the feature data rather than just using a library. So let's let's move on um, and give a more concrete example. This is more data science-like. Here we have a table with an ID and we have an array of features. And you may look at this data and say, I've done a machine learning uh, course and I can see that this is numerical data and we know that when we train models, we have numerical data and everything is great. And maybe the WizKid data scientist looks at this and says, well, you know, I see quite a, you know, quite a spread between these numbers. So we might have some numerical instability here. I'm gonna normalize these numbers. So the, these numbers are floating point numbers. Normalizing it means, it means squashing those numbers into a range, typically between either zero and one or 0.5 and minus 0.5. Um, and, this normalization where we're taking the original column, the features column, and we're converting it into another column called L1 norm, uh, norm which is the L1 norm we're computing over those values. Um, you write some code to do that. So in, in a typical um, you know, data engineering company, you'll have a little bit of code. It might be written in Pandas, it might be written in PySpark. This example is showing you the code in PySpark, and it's gonna use um, an L1 norm to compute that. So there, that library is already available in PySpark. So our particular feature store, the Hopster feature store, um, it builds on three main concepts. And I'm jumping straight into that rather than talking historically about other feature stores. So companies like Uber and Airbnb have talked about their features. There's a website called featurestore.org that has a very good summary of available production feature stores. And pretty much every hyperscale AI company has a feature store. But our feature store is a general purpose feature store. We didn't build it for a specific domain. We didn't have a domain specific language to do feature engineering. So the example I showed you was code in PySpark. So the abstraction we build our feature store on is a data frame. So what we the, the abstractions we provide to users, we're gonna ingest the, the data into our feature store as data frames. So as a result of that, we what we have are features as a kind of a, a flat namespace of of what features are available in the feature store. We'll see in our latest version, we actually scope them by the feature group name. Um, but today I'm just gonna show you the flat namespace version. Um, but the features that come into the feature store, they come in as uh, data frames or groups of features. So maybe we, we can, we, th this is an example from data science. It's quite a well-known example. You're trying to predict if a passenger in the Titanic survived or not. And this data set exists and maybe it comes from a database, okay? And you know, in a in a different type of use case, this data will be updated uh, frequently. 
Um, in our platform, we, we support Hoodie as a backing um, table for, the, for these feature groups. So they're going to be stored on, on Hoodie in Hive. So it's an external table in Hive, but we're going to use a Hoodie file format. That means we can do upserts. We can update these feature groups as they come in. We don't need to drop them and recreate them. But the, the data comes in uh, and we store it, the set of features as a feature group. So here we have four features inside the Titanic passenger list data. But data will come in from many different sources, not just from a, a, a one database. It may come in from a data lake. It may come in from uh, Kafka. It may come in from wherever. So let's assume that another source of data came in. And in this case, the data was a historian who looked up the uh, passengers in the Titanic and looked up how much money they had in their bank account. And this came in from you know, this museum over here. So we now have uh, a set of features in our feature store. They're grouped by feature groups. And data scientists can come in, and they can look at the features. And they can basically say, well, I, I would like to join together a bunch of these features that are in the feature store to create some training test data that I'll use to train my model with. So what they would do typically in this case, if you saw this data, is you might have a hypothesis that if I join the bank balance down here with the existing features in our Titanic passenger list, well, then I might be better able to predict if a passenger survives or not. OK. so. The data scientist is going to join these together. I'll show you the code for how to do this. It's much simpler than this diagram. But they'll join those features together, get a training test data set. It's actually a data frame they're going to get back. And then they can decide on what file format to materialize that as if they're going to. You can work with the data frame directly, but often if you're doing deep learning, you might say, well, I'm going to store it as TF record file format. And I'm going to store it where GCS, S3, or on our file system, HopsFS which is a, a next generation HDFS. So these are the concepts that we have. You have features. They're grouped together. Uh, you can combine them or join them together to create training test data sets, and you store those wherever you want to use them. Now, everything here is going to be versioned um, because we want to be able to reproduce uh, this process of creating training data sets. And with the help of Hoodie, we can actually even, even um, version based on the current state of a feature group, the current state of it as of this moment in time. OK, so let's let's uh, take a little step back. That's the abstractions that we have in our platform and talk a bit about where these features come from. So the features will come in uh, and be ingested into the feature store. I said already it's going to be a store. And some of them will have very low latency requirements. And some of them will maybe be ingested periodically every day or every week or every month from a data lake. They may come in from operational databases, data warehouses, uh, Kafka, um, other event sources. And here are a couple of examples of them. So we have one company we're working with who need uh, their features to be transformed in less than two seconds. So someone's entering something on a form. And then we need that, that, that data being entered by the user to be transformed into features so that it can be used uh, by the application. But that's a very low latency use case. But for all of the other use cases where we have a, a, you know 10, 20, 30 seconds, or uh, minutes, or hours, or days, well, then we can we can run different types of applications. So we can maybe use a batch Spark application to take the data from the backend platform and push it into the feature store. And in this case, we also do streaming applications for the lower latency um, data sources. So all of these will, will, will come in. These features will come in. At and at different cadences, they're going to update the feature store. So who's going to use the feature store? Well, we have out here an online application. And the online application. For example, if it's trying to predict something like fraud, it might say, well, I have a bunch of uh, features that I got, um, which were, for example, what is being purchased? What's the ID of the item being purchased? What does my session uh, look like right now, my shopping cart? Uh, do you have a, I have an identity already in the system that we can use? So these IDs we can use to look up features, historical features about uh, the user. Have they bought a lot from here? Have they, is their shopping cart? Or has it been filled up and, and emptied recently a lot? Um, you know, anything, any events or features that can help predict uh, if we, this transaction is going to be fraudulent or not, uh, we can go to the feature store. Other users of the feature store are data scientists who will create training data. And we saw that already in the previous example. But also, uh, you can have batch applications can just pull features directly and use them to make predictions. So it's not going to pull out the actual label. It's just going to say, I need, I can use these features. I have a model. And now I can actually just run those features against the model to make predictions or score that model. Now, the thing that's interesting here is that 
if the feature store were a, a database, you would expect that it would be able to provide the features to the feature store in, in less to the online application in less than 10 milliseconds. And you expect also that it will scale to many terabytes in size. We have a, a customer, Swedbank, who have over 40 terabytes of feature data in just one uh, particular use case. And there was a talk at the Sparks last part summit about that. So the problem here is that we want to store many terabytes of data. We want a scale out database, and it also needs to have extremely low latency. So there aren't any existing databases that we're aware of or anybody else who's developing a feature store is aware of um, that has these properties. So what we do is we actually split up the feature store into an online uh, layer uh, that's going to serve the features, a serving store, and an offline feature store. So this is a scalable SQL database, typically. So what, what this does is it now complicates uh, the process uh, quite significantly. As you can see here, whenever we um, want to store these features, we need to actually now know, am I storing to online, am I storing to offline, am I storing to both? And you can imagine the complexity of writing your Spark streaming app or your Spark batch app, and it's got to write to your online database, uh, and it's also going to write to your offline database. So our online database is MySQL cluster, or MDB, and our offline database is Apache Hive, and they share the same metadata layer in our platform. Now, what we did to, to, to make this very complex architecture simpler, uh, it's kind of Lambda architecture-like, but we introduced a data frame API. So what the data frame API gives us is the ability for our applications. So we have Spark streaming apps here, for example, and they're going to just save their data frames to the feature store. And our API gives them that simplicity. They don't need to worry about whether it's going online, offline. They just set a flag when they create the feature group and say, hey, this is going to both online and offline, or this is just going to offline. Um, the data frame API doesn't just work for Spark. It also works for Pandas, uh, Python data frames. It will convert them to par uh, to Parquet files. And, and ultimately, offline data will be stored as Parquet and external tables and Hive um, with Hoodie if you decide to use Hoodie. Um, and then the, uh, the online feature store will have tables in MySQL cluster. For use cases where we can't, we don't have enough time to push the data to the feature store and pull it out at the online application, uh, we can on our platform support Flink. And Flink can read data from a Kafka topic that's input, and then write the output to another Kafka topic, and the online lab can pull it. And we can do, we're, we're doing that for a, a two second use case. So, um, so what we introduced here was this, this notion of the um, data frame API to simplify the process of ingesting data. So let's have a look at the code. Uh, this is a very simple example. We, we're, we're going to have a data frame that's going to read up data from a back end system. And then we're going to do some feature en engineering on that data frame. Um, we saw an example earlier. And then we create a feature group. If we want to make it online, we just set online equals true here. And it will uh, synchronize that updates to that data frame to both the online and offline feature stores. So let's go ahead. So yeah, we've covered this part here. This is the ingestion of data into the feature store. Let's have a quick look at online applications and then how we create training test data sets. So creating training test data sets, we'll start with that one. So our platform uses uh, Spark to, to join the feature groups together. So if you have features that, that come from several different feature groups, um, your code might look something like this, fs.getFeatures. And in the flat namespace case, we just put in the names of the features. And it will return a data frame. Um, so what it's actually doing is it's running a Spark application to read up these data frames, join them together using the a common join key. So our query planner will look for the largest overlapping set of primary keys between the two data frames involved. And if you have multiple data frames, then it's going to look between the joins. It'll, uh, again, examine the largest overlapping set of join keys or primary keys. Now, this Spark application can run on our platform, Hopsworks, or it can run on Databricks, for example. And ex any external Spark cluster will work. And it will, that Spark application will then materialize the uh, training test data to wherever you want it to be stored. And this is what it looks like in code. This is a this slightly more complete example. And in this example, we get back this data frame as the join of all of the, the features. And we just say, hey, I'd like this data to be stored as TF records. And we have another um, parameter here called connector. And the connector can point to an S3 bucket or to our file system in HopsFS. 
and everything is versioned, so you can specify versions if you want. You can get latest versions if you want to increment the version of a training test, test data set. Uh, so that's basically it. Now, we have updated this API somewhat um, to add scopes. I'm going to show you how we do this. So in the newer version um, that will be released this month, it's not, not out yet, uh, we get the feature groups. So we need to know then where, where the features come from. What feature groups do they come from? So we, we get the feature groups, and, and it's good practice to, to specify the version to make produ try proper production code. Uh, what you can do uh, to, to try and use our query planner again is you can just say in a very Pythonic way, uh, select all the features from the first feature group and join them with all the features from the second feature group. And this data frame that you get returned, join features, we, um, we can then save it. So in this case, we're, we now have an extra line because the training data object is a metadata object. It's a, a lazy object that we use to create the training data set. So at this point, there's no training data has been materialized. It's only after we make the last line called td.save on the data frame that, that we, we got back from the feature groups that we joined together. It's only at this point down here where we're actually gonna save the date, training data to uh, a file system. And in this case, we're saving it to S3, to a bucket, and that's specified here. So some other improvements we have, apart from the things we had before, such as the, the file format, things like NumPy, um, you know, Petastorm are, are, are a popular CSV or popular file formats. But um, it's nice and easy now to just create the split. So your training data will be 70% of the data, 20% of the data will be test data, and 10% will be validation data. It just makes it a little bit easier um, using this new API. Now we support time travel queries. Um, uh, for creating these training data sets. You can say, hey, I'd like to have the training data for these feature groups as the training data looked like at this moment in time. Or you can say, for example, give me the training data that, or the, the, the data, the features that arrived in a feature group between a time interval, between a start point and an end point in time. So the way it works is it's using Apache hoodie underneath the uh, covers um, to, to basically get the changes in a, in a feature group um, in a particular interval, and this is the interval case. So we're going to get the bank data as it look, uh, the bank data that arrived between the 1st of January 1912 and the 4th, 14th of, of April. And in the first case, we're going to get this feature group as it looked like at this particular moment in time, so this point of time. So we can sequel have this keyword as of, and, and that's what we have effectively here. Um, hoodie is very similar to uh, Delta Lake by Databricks, and it provides atomic and incremental updates of feature groups, which is really nice. And there's a hoodie talk, I think, on Thursday, which uh, you might want to look into. So how does the online feature store use this, uh, or online applications use this online feature store? Well, if you have an online application that we have here, what it wants to do first is it says, well, I'm missing a bunch of features. So I need to go to the feature store to guess the features that I'm missing. Things like historical information about what the user has done, maybe their credit history, uh, anything that's been computed offline and uh, materialized to the online feature store we can do. So what the online application can do, and this can be done within the model as well, but basically they make a, a query to the feature store and say, hey, I have, the, uh, I have the keys, the primary keys for this particular training data set. So I have the primary keys for the feature groups that were joined together to make up this training data set. Um, can you please give me back a feature vector? So that basically does a, uh, a bunch of primary key lookups and joins them together in the online feature store, MySQL cluster. Uh, when you start up the app, you typically will, will, will get that query back as a cached um, a prepared statement, and then you just make the, it'll make the uh, query for you directly on the database. You don't. It's not a two two round trip. It's just a single round trip to get that um, feature vector. So once you have once you have the feature vector, you go to your model, and typically we don't uh, serve models uh, embedded inside the application. We if it's TensorFlow serving server, we would uh, deploy the model on that TensorFlow serving server, typically in Kubernetes and um, then it would could be replicated across uh, different availability zones, for example, in the cloud. And our database, our online database is a HA, it's transactional, and it supports uh, high availability across availability zones in the cloud. So a little bit more detail on how that works internally. Our online application has, uh, it's received a number of IDs, entity IDs. If it's a, a fraud example, you might have the ID of the order, um, the customer that's involved, the amount of money, the product ID, and things like that. With those, ID, 
IDs, or keys as we're calling them here, um, what we can do is we can go to the feature store and say, hey, I want a prepared statement to look up the feature vector with these keys. So once it's got that prepared statement, it can cache it locally, the online application, and then it can make this uh, query on the online feature store with that set of keys. And then once it's got back the feature vector, it can then make the predictions on the model. So um, this is part of Hopsworks. Uh, like I said, it's a modular platform. And the feature store itself, uh, it, it's, uh, it's here. And it, it needs the file system. It has uh, Hive and MySQL cluster. Um, you can run the whole platform. So you can do your feature engineering here and your model training here on our platform. You can even do model serving and monitoring if you want. And optionally, Kafka is included in the platform as well. So it's a, it's a pretty complete platform for doing not just model training, but also data engineering. Uh, we can see here that we even have Airflow, and I'll, I'll show a quick demo on that as well in a minute. So here's what an end-to-end -end pipeline looks like. And it's, remember, it's not an end-to-end -end pipeline because the pipeline will, will start here at the back end, and, and the first pipeline will start there, and the second pipeline will be training, and that will appear after. So let's have a quick look. We have feature engineering that happens first, and once the features are in the feature store, then the data scientists can can basically do all of all of that we can see here these steps that they can train models and and it's an experiment it's an iterative process you get features you get training data you train models you uh, analyze your models validate them deploy them to a model repository and then applications batch applications can use them directly if you have online or operational models you then deploy that model to a model serving server and online applications can use them. The online applications or the model serving server itself can get the feature vectors uh, as it needs them to build the whole feature vectors that are used to, to serve the models. We do model monitoring by actually uh, taking the predictions that are made and logging them to Kafka. And then we can use Spark Streaming typically to, uh, to monitor those predictions to make sure that uh, the incoming features don't diverge significantly from the features that we trained the model on. And the way we do that is we actually go to the online feature store and say, hey, give me the statistics, the descriptive statistics for this training data set. And then we can compare those with the ones that are being computed on live data. So we, we use Windows to compute the, the, you know, the mean, the standard deviation, max and min for given features. And then we can automatically compare those with um, the training uh, statistics and then notify uh, if there's a problem. So the platform is a bit more than this. We do multi-worker training. Uh, I'm going to maybe show Maggie, which is a way of doing um, hyperparameter optimization, but it's, it's just part of the example. And then we also do um, project-based multi-tenancy. So you can have uh, sensitive data in a shared cluster. Um, there is also support for provenance, um, similar to TFX and MLflow, um, but we do it implicitly. And I won't have time to go through that in this talk. I'm going to do a demo in a second, but I'll just tell you how you can try out the platform. It is open source. There's a community version. Um, there's an installer for it. If you go to our documentation, just Google Hopsource documentation, you'll find it. If you're interested in trying out um, the enterprise version, you can go to the managed version. We have a SaaS version on AWS called hopsource.ai. And then we also have an enterprise version that can be installed on-premise or um, uh, in the cloud, so on Azure and GCP as well. So I'm going to do a demo, and I'm going to go through a demo where we have a churn model. We're, we're, we're computing a churn model for telecom users. Uh, this data set came from a Kaggle competition. Um, but we're going to create a feature group from a, 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 this uh, original uh, raw data. We're going to create some training data from the features um, that, that we've added to the feature store, train a model using it. And that's kind of um, as far as we'll get in this example. You can extend this then to do online um, feature serving. So I'm just going to skip to the. Um, to my browser. And um, I'm not going to show you how to get started on Hopsworks AI, but this is what I'm using. Um, you can create an account here. You need to link your AWS account um, to, uh, to enable Hopsworks AI to launch a cluster in your account. So you just click, once you've done that, you can click Create Cluster. I've run this one already. Mm -hmm. And that's this one here. Uh, I'll just show you. So when, when it comes up, you'll see basically this, and you can log in. Now, I've created a project already, but I have a couple of minutes, so I'll just show you how to create a new project. I'll call this one Telecom. And a project is, uh, I mentioned already, it's a, it's a kind of a, a sandbox. We have this project-based multi-tenancy model. So 
all data and uh, users and programs inside this project, kind of like a GitHub repository, and um, they're going to be private. So if I give someone access to the project as, as in a role called data scientist, then they can't copy data out. They can't even read data from other projects they're a member of. So it's, it's really, you're really restricting them inside here. So I created this project, and the example I'm going to go through is here at Jim Dowling slash churn on uh, GitHub. And um, what I'm going to just do to get started is I'm going to install a bunch of Python libraries. So um, in this platform, the way you install Python libraries is you just um, use Conda or pip. So off you go, and this will take a couple of seconds. Uh, the example actually is going to be, um, it's some raw telecom data, but I'm going to use XGBoost uh, to, to train the model. Uh, we support XGBoost, and it's like it learned TensorFlow, PyTorch, they're the pretty common ones. Um, the common uh, frameworks that people use. Just take a couple of seconds. You can actually also import a conda file here instead. It would have gone slightly faster, but I thought I'll do it this way. So we have pip here as well. And I can just search again. So what makes it slightly different is that we'll actually build the Docker file in the background from your conda environment file here. And that's kind of nice because data scientists then don't need to actually write Docker files. Um, the last library here, this is called Imbalanced Learn. Um, um, there we go. OK, so they're going to start um, installing them. Th this is what we get in our base environment. What I'm going to do is um, there's no feature store here currently. Um, we have feature groups, train data sets, feature search, and feature store details. I'm just going to um, open a notebook. And in the notebook, I think this should be OK. I'm going to put in my GitHub repo, which was here. Copy that. Um, I added an API key already, so we enable Git. That's probably a good idea. Um, this is the GitHub repo. Um, I have an API key uploaded to Hopsworth. You can see in our doc documentation how to do that. Um, did I add one? Turn any of these. OK. Um, it doesn't look like one of those. OK. So a quick look. Secrets. Um, Let's go back. Let's enable Git again. Uh, there we go. And um, I'm going to just deploy this from master. So uh, it just takes a second to go to GitHub and find it. OK, so in this case, it's actually going to run a PySpark application. I'm, going to give it two gigs to the driver, two gigs to the executor, and it's just a single CPU. It's not a huge amount of uh, resources. And this is something called um, GitLab. And um, we can see here there's a number of notebooks. Um, we have this. Uh, this is our uh, data set here. And this is what you'll find in GitHub. So what I'm going to do is um, a couple of things. I'm going to copy this data set into uh, Hopsworks. We could run with it locally, but I'm, I'm going to make a job out of this later on. So I'm just going to go through this. So let's not upload. Let's create a folder first. I'm going to call the folder churn. Um, and I'm just going to, we're going to, yeah, I'm going to upload my, my some of the code from, from GitHub to, I'm going to upload everything in here actually to to Hopsburg. So this is uploading data to the file system. So if I go this copy from local uh, star to the path in HDFS, it just copies this data and it maintains the same username. So um, if we go back here, we'll see that the data has been copied up. Um, now you can obviously you know, attach a, the commit ID if you want and get to, to notice not which version of the, the repo it is. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to actually then run the first notebook, which is to create a feature group. Um, let's actually, before we do that, let's check to make sure that everything has been installed. Yes, it has. Um, I'm going to actually, before we do that, I'm going to close this notebook and I'm going to go back for one second and show you the feature store because I notice I'm running out of time. So we can, uh, this is a feature store that I've already run. And um, this one is what you'll get when you run the tour. Um, you can see we have a bunch of feature groups here. 
and we have um, the ability to look up statistics on the feature groups. So when you ingest a feature group, it will automatically, if, by default, it will compute these statistics. So things like clustering analysis, uh, we have correlations and distributions of individual features. Um, so this is nice for exploratory data analysis. Uh, you, there's a UI here for creating training data sets by selecting features. I'm going to skip that. And um, we have individual features here. So the overview of the feature store here, you can see there's 24 features, six feature groups, one training data set. And um, yeah, so that's a, a basic overview of the feature. You can search for features here. And we can see here that we can search for features across the different feature stores. In fact, I think I might have a minute to just run this one example because I didn't, I just skipped through it. Um, but the there's a, there's a bunch of different, um, let's go back and run it. Okay, so I'm just gonna run this here, run all cells. So this is a Spark application and um, what it's doing is it's reading up some data from from our HDFS. So I copied this data in, I didn't copy it here, I copied it into churn, so we need to change that. Resources churn, okay, um, so that's the correct uh, path. And it's going to um, do some feature engineering. So this is the feature engineering, you can look at it, and then it's gonna create the feature group. So once it's created the feature group, what it, it's running the Spark application here now, we can look at that where it starts. We can see it just as a single executor. And um, if we go back, we can see what it looked like when it finished. So I ran this already. And when it finishes, you'll get this feature group appearing in here. Now, um, it computes statistics on it. We saw that already. We can get a preview of the data as well, which is kind of nice. Um, that's this one. So like as a data scientist, you often want to preview data very quickly. Um, what, I, what I also did in this case is um, I, you can also take those notebooks and turn them into jobs. So that's originally why I created them as um, I copied them to HDFS because we can create a job from those notebooks. And then from those notebooks, we, 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 we can have a, every notebook can be turned into an individual job and we can actually chain them together in Airflow. And I'm just gonna show that uh, is the last thing I do before I finish. So you can have, for example, your training pipeline look like this. Um, we can add a, Two notebooks, for example, we could say the first one is um, we're going to compute the hyperparameters and save that. And then in the second notebook, we are going to wait for the hyperparameters to be uh, computed and then we're going to train. So we've computed good hyperparameters. Once we get good hyperparameters, we can pass them on to training. So this, <clears throat> this particular um, notebook that I just created, um, which was one of these here. Um, this is a, a, a so it's not a notebook, it's a, it's a DAG, it's a, a DAG in, um, in Airflow. We can actually run that then, and you can schedule that to run as often as you want. And it was this one I created, I think. You can schedule it to run like uh, hourly or on an event. Um, and we can see that what will happen is that it'll actually start the job running um, when it kicks off. Uh, we can see it's, it's starting to kick off here. And see yeah so it's going to call those two phases those two different notebooks and if we go back to our jobs ui we can see that it's kicked off the first one it's just accepted and then this will go into the running state so now it's in the running state it's just like any spark app you can kind of monitor it look at the metrics and so on i'm out of time so i'm going to uh go back and uh, say thank you. That's kind of the, the brief demo of, of the platform. We have a lot more videos on the website you can look up. It's logicbox.com. We're on Twitter and we're on GitHub. And I have a lot of people to thank um, at our company. And you can see their names there. Okay, so that's it from me. Are we back to StreamYard? That's kind of cool, infinite view. So thanks a lot, Jim. That was a very interesting presentation. I hope you still have time for a couple of questions. Maybe we. Yeah, I'll drop over to the to the to the room. I you know right. I'm, uh, I have another meeting coming up, but I'll be there for a couple of minutes. Okay, maybe we can just take a couple of questions here, and then I will maybe uh, because it doesn't. Maybe just one, just one, and then. Okay, so. All right. 
Actually, I think the most common one that we have is related to the time travel API. Yes. So there are a couple of questions. So is it possible with Hopsworks to go back in time with feature values to consistently backtest your ML model? And there's a related question so about the time travel API. Yeah. One of the main use cases is to kind of avoid future poisoning of labeled data. So yes. I don't want get me all the records at time T1. Yeah. I would want to say, get me all the records as they were at the time of an event. Let's say, click of the record, click of a record. So, could you please comment on that? Yeah. So, I mean, the, like we, we, you can add a, a, a you know, a, a, a column to your feature groups called the the time at which the event was created as well. And typically, you might roll them up to a day, and if you want, to, or to an hour, or some 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 interval of time. Um. So, so when you join your feature groups, if you join on that column. Then it will match them up uh, according to the time, so that the features will be correct at the same time. So you can explicitly, if you explicitly join on the on the time column, uh, your feature groups, then that will work fine. 